And good morning to you. Take your hymnal, please, number 46. 46. Stand with me, please, as we sing, Crown Him with Many Crowns. 46. Good to see you on this beautiful, beautiful Lord's Day morning. Amen. I checked the weather for tonight. I mean, it always will say 98%, 95%. It said 100% chance of rain tonight. So um, they're so sure of themselves. But I appreciate your faithfulness and being where God would have us to be as his people. In this, and as I said, this beautiful Lord's Day morning. Are you glad you're saved? Amen. Amen. Let's pray together. Father, we are glad that we are saved and not just saved, Father, but sanctified and secured. We're glad, Father, that we have this your church, the New Testament church, the assembly of your people that you gave to us in your great wisdom. And I pray that we will, we will not waste the opportunities that are afforded all of us here today to worship you, to give to you, to hear from your word, and to have the fellowship of the Spirit. And I pray, God, that we'll not waste it to your honor and to your glory. If there's somebody here today who on this rainy morning has come into this place and not saved, May they know they're not here by accident and that you have a message for them as well. In every way, speak to our hearts, please, in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Be seated. As you're seated, number two, number two, come Christians, join to sing.
good to have visitors here with us. And of course, Alicia Reagan and her daughter and others. We are very grateful and thankful for all the workers and those who helped with the ladies uh, conference the last couple of days. The fellowship of the ladies and um, just fellowshipping around the word of God and God's people was a blessing. And so welcome and God bless you and thank you. All the visitors here, raise your hand. Would you do that? All the guests of Beacon Baptist Church, raise them up high. Welcome. God bless you. There you go. Welcome back to many of you and your honored guests here at Beacon Baptist Church. Our text is 2 Timothy 4, if you want to turn ahead, 2 Timothy chapter number 4. Reminding you that next Sunday is our church picnic. We have the morning service. Right after the morning service, we go to the gym for a picnic. The church will provide some meat and drinks, but sign up in the foyer to bring some as well, sides, desserts. And uh, everybody here is invited, of course, to be a part of that. Your giving statements are in the back, alphabetical order. Go back there and get yours as soon as possible. Youth activity is on Friday, February the 8th, over in the gym, 6 to 9 p.m. See the Dobluses if you have any more questions about it. We'll give you more information later. But Friday the 8th, over in the gym, teenagers. Also reminding you that we have two youth trips, as always, coming up this summer. One is to the wilds. You must register by the 1st. And then also Pensacola. Now, Pensacola trip has thrown a little bit of a curve because we have about half registered and then we have about half on a waiting list. So that, that week is already filled up. So if you want to be a part of it in any way, shape, or form, you need to sign up by today. So forget about the 17th that we've been announcing. You need to register by today. And so young people and parents, there won't be any delay on this. I hope you'll do it. If, if necessary, we may move it to another week so that the ones who do register by today Okay, even the other weeks are filling up, filling up um, that we'll get all of our young people in on the same trip. So please keep that in mind. Mission trip, going to the Wales, going to Wales. If you're interested, sign up in the foyer. There's a meeting tonight for anyone and everyone interested in going to Wales right after the evening service. And so don't forget about that. Some information will be passed out to you that you can pass out to others as, as well. So be here. Brother Chris Eastap um, has blessed us in the past. If you want to hear a young man who is sincere, from head to toe, his love for God, his service, his ministry, he pastors there in Waynesville, and uh, is just sincere, a godly young man. Come here tonight and hear my friend, Brother Chris, and be in your places for that. And again, to all of our visitors who are here, God bless you, and thank you for being here.
him is number 247. And we are honored this morning. Many of you know Amy Street. And uh, of course, Bob is going to be baptized a little bit later. But the lady who led her to the Lord, longtime veteran missionary in Japan, is visiting with us. And we're blessed to see her and her fruit, spiritual fruit, in the Lord. And so God bless her. And um, if you get a chance, just say hi to her and pray for her for sure as they continue to minister. 247, let's stand, shall we? The old rugged cross. 247. our salvation. Our Father, we thank you that you offered to us as a free gift by grace through faith alone. Even now, Father, we give back to you a portion that you blessed us with out of grateful hearts for what you've done for us and for what you've given to us. And we give you the praise in Jesus' name. Amen.
Thank you so much for that. That was beautiful, wasn't it? Appreciate that so much. Our scripture reading this morning is taken from 2 Timothy chapter 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4. We'll be reading responsibly verses 17 through 22 of 2 Timothy chapter 4. I'll give you a moment to find out your Bible. 2 Timothy 4, beginning with verse 17, down through the end of the chapter. <clears throat> Shall we stand together for the reading of God's word? Notwithstanding, the Lord stood with me and strengthened me that by me the preaching might be fully known and that all the Gentiles might hear, and I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion. And the Lord shall deliver me from every evil work and will preserve me unto his heavenly kingdom, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Salute Priscilla and Aquila, and the household of Onesiphorus. Erastus abode at Corinth, but Trophimus have I left at Miletum sick. Do thy diligence to come before winter. Eubulus greeteth thee, and Prudence, and Linus, and Claudia, and all the brethren. The Lord Jesus Christ be with thy spirit. Grace be unto you. Amen. Our Father, once again this morning, we thank you for the privilege of ours to hear from your word, Lord, I pray that you'll help each of us to prepare our hearts even now for the message you have for us. Remove anything from our minds that would be a hindrance to your Holy Spirit, having full reign in our lives. And we'll give you the praise for all this said and done. In Jesus' name, amen.
God bless them. Look again this morning, if you would, this text, verse 20. You'll notice in Paul's last, final, recorded words on earth, he mentions a certain place and a certain person. Verse 20, Erastus abode at Corinth, but Trophimus have I left at Miletum sick. Now, the place, you'll notice in the text, is called Miletum. And the person who's associated with that text for all of eternity now is Trophimus. Trophimus, you may recall, was no stranger to young Timothy, to whom Paul is writing this, his final epistle. In fact, Trophimus, just like Timothy, was Greek and that he had a Greek father. Also, just like Timothy, he's a man who is listed in Acts chapter 20 and verse 4 as one of Paul's companions during that great third missionary journey. Later in Acts, Trophimus is mentioned again as the single one person, the very person that Paul was arrested and bound and put into prison in Jerusalem for. You say, Pastor, how so? Well, let me just read it to you. You don't need to turn there. Very quickly from the book of Acts. It says, The Jews which were of Asia, when they saw him, Paul, in the temple, stirred up all the people and laid hands on him crying out, men of Israel, help, this is the man that teacheth all men everywhere against the people and the law and this place. And further, listen to this, he's brought Greeks into the temple and hath polluted this holy place. For they had seen before with Paul in the city Trophimus, an Ephesian, whom they supposed Paul had brought into the temple. Now, if you're wondering exactly how this man Trophimus, an Ephesian, ended up with Paul in the holy city of Jerusalem, all you have to do is go back a little bit in the book of Acts, and Luke explains that, and I'm going to read that to you. Listen carefully. And there accompanied Paul, Gaius of Derbe and Timotheus, and of Asia, Tychicus and Trophimus. These going before tarried for us at Troas, and we sailed away from Philippi. And from Miletus he sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church, And when they were come to him, they said unto him, Ye know from the first day that I came into Asia, after what manner I've been with you at all seasons. And now, behold, I go bound in the Spirit unto Jerusalem, not knowing the things which shall befall me there. In other words, here you have a man. His name is Trophimus. He sailed with Paul before Jerusalem. He sailed and labored and worked with Paul at Jerusalem. And as our text from prison in Rome indicates he was also traveling with him after Jerusalem. So this is a man who spent a lot of time traveling with the great apostle Paul. Now, if you're wondering what is so significant about that, then all you have to do is consider what it is that Paul wrote in his last final days on this earth. Trophimus, he said, I had to leave behind at Miletum sick. Now you think about that. Sick. Do you know how many times and in how many different places this same man, Saul Trophimus, witnessed people that were sick being cured and healed in Paul's ministry? Do you realize that Trophimus witnessed what Paul described as perils of the sea and perils of robbers and thus miraculous deliverances from both? And most of all, how many times he witnessed divine healing. He was there when Eutychus was raised to life after that terrible fall from on high. When Publius' father was healed of disease, he likely saw, according to Acts chapter 28, many others which he healed, which had diseases they were cured and healed. So that, look, Trophimus was a missionary. Understand this. He was a missionary who saw and testified to all the glory and the power of God, and especially towards sick and diseased. And so, why is it that in his final words on this earth, testifying that the time of his departure is at hand, he has finished his course, he's kept the faith, why is it that Paul includes the words of verse 20, his last words on earth, Trophimus have I left at Miletum, he says, sick. Hey, what happened at Miletum? Why did not the Lord do there as Trophimus witnessed through Paul elsewhere? Well, it's a fair question. And you know what? It's precisely because we have the question 
that we know and believe that Trophimus was included in this scripture as a powerful reminder to us all of how God works in the lives of his own. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. And Lord, we need to hear from you today. And there are folks in this room, I don't know who they are, but I know that you led me to this text, to these truths for this day, for such a time as this. And I know, Father, that there are some folks in here who need to be reminded of the truths of your word and your works. And may we all do so in Jesus' name. Amen. Four lessons I want us to consider this morning from this remarkable testimony by Paul in the closing days of his ministry and life. The first one you'll notice, number one, is a lesson of purpose. Now, I want to ask you a question. Have you ever noticed how this epistle ends? Or how we would think that it would end? It's verse 18. He says, And the Lord shall deliver me from every evil work. And will preserve me unto his heavenly kingdom, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Folks, that's an ending. Hollywood style. Cut, wrap, print. That's an ending. It's awesome. But it's not the ending. So that, you know what? This little detail about Paul leaving his brother and friend behind without a healing. You understand something. We understand that this is not just some throwaway information here in the Word of God. Everything that Paul was doing, everything that he was writing in his journeys reflected the purposes of God. And of course, as a sick man, Trophimus knew what God could do. Trophimus knew that God had already, he saw what he had already done through the Apostle Paul. God could heal any person with any affliction any disease, at any time, and at any place, and he still can today on this Lord's Day morning. And you know, if you think about it, there are two men there with Trophimus on this day. A, there is Luke, the beloved physician. And B, there is Paul, the healing apostle. Trophimus knows perfectly well that he is in very good hands. In fact, he's in the best of hands. So I want you to think about the scene for just a moment. Trophimus is one of Paul's earliest converts when Paul first went to that great city of Ephesus with the gospel. And now, some years later, as a faithful servant of God and a servant of God's man, you see him in Scripture. He's traveling, folks. He's ministering everywhere with Paul, including the holy city of Jerusalem. He was a Greek but he was now a devoted follower and servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. And now, as Paul is soon to return to Rome, on this Paul's final trip to his very execution, there's at least one man who really wants to go along. You see, verse 10 says in our text, Demas has forsaken him. It says that Crescens has gone to Galatia, Titus to Dalmatia. It says that Erastus, in verse 20, you see it, abode at Corinth. And for good reason, you know, he's the mayor of Corinth. But everybody, it seems, has places to be except on this journey with Paul. And so it is that Paul says in verse 11, only Luke is with me. Only Luke is left. It's a pretty sad scene if you think about it. Except, of course, there's one man who started out being with him. There was one man who was still there at the very beginning of the end, and he wants to travel with Paul no matter what. His name is Trophimus, and so I can picture this. There on the quay at Miletum, the master of the ship that Paul is about to sail on, blows that final horn as a signal for all the passengers to board. And there is Paul, and there is Luke. And they're going up the plank onto the ship, and the dock lines are cast off, and the red sail is raised, and the south wind blows softly, filling it all out, and the ship begins to move out of the harbor westward toward Rome. Paul and Luke wave a final goodbye, perhaps to a little group of disciples there on the shore, and they to him. But again, you'll see this. Missing on that day was one of Paul's faithful companions. He is far too ill now to make this journey. And you can see his pale face, 
His friends perhaps raised him on his bed. Maybe he can witness a final departure of Paul. Maybe he's able to lift a hand in a little feeble gesture of farewell. But you know he would fall backwards, exhausted on that meager pallet. Of all of the journeys that he had ever taken with Paul for the cause of Christ, this would be his most anticipated. You realize he's waited two full years, the Bible says. While Paul was incarcerated to have this great reunion, but Trophimus, you see, was too sick to walk, too sick apparently even to be carried on board to that ship. And you can see in the text that clearly both Trophimus and Paul had planned for him to be on this journey, but something happened. Something that brought deep, deep disappointment. Because somewhere in the midst of all their plans, Trophimus fell sick. Very sick. You realize that Trophimus and Miletum are included in the last verses that Paul would ever write on this earth. These are his last words. But why these words? Why sick? Why Miletum? Why left there? That sounds so despairing. Why can't we see Paul maybe leaving him on that other place of victory? That little island, it sounds like Miletum, it's called Milita. Milita was a little island where Paul performed many miracles and people got saved and one man even raised that other place. Why not associate Trophimus with miracles and healings and deliverance and glory? Why can't Miletum... Be like the little island of Melita. You know, the word Melita, we noted this some years ago, literally means honey. We were teaching through the book of Acts. And that little ancient island was known in the first century for its great export of honey. It's modern-day Malta today. Well, that's pretty sweet. Who wouldn't want to live and minister on the island of honey? It's a Mediterranean island just off the coast of Italy. That would be the purpose of God. And you know something, folks? Hear this. It was the purpose of God for some folks for a little while. Luke says in Acts chapter 28 that the Miletians, quote, honored us with many honors and laid at us and showed us no little kindness. You know what they thought? They thought that Paul was a god because of all the healings that were going on. I mean, you talk about honey. Publius, the chief ruler of the island, made a feast, the Bible says. I don't know what it was. It must have been honey-baked ham with honey mustard sauce and honey butter roasted yams and honey apple cake and honey bunches of oats or something. I don't know, but I mean, that's a place to be. Everybody tends to agree, if you've ever heard anyone teach on that passage, that that little island was the purpose of God. It was a miracle they were on that island. And you know what happened there? People got saved, sicknesses were healed, faithfulness was rewarded, preachers were treated like demigods. I mean, what could be better than that, amen? You know, God is good on the island. Do you all see the goodness of God on this little island? What people tend to forget is that the same immutable God is just as good when sickness wasn't healed at the harbor The same man in either place. You know, there are a few commentaries from the faith, healing, and prosperity crowd. And if you read them and you read this text here in 2 Timothy, they have the opinion that that Trophimus and their opinion about Miletum and Trophimus is frankly pretty whacked. They say the only explanation for Paul's confession in verse 20 is one of three things. A, Trophimus didn't have enough faith. B, Paul was backslidden and lost his anointing, or C, sin in Trophimus' heart led to this sickness and thus his judgment. Now, folks, I'm telling you right now that is pure slander and carnal thinking. Did they forget that Paul himself had a thorn in the flesh, his entire anointed ministry, and it was a thorn that God never removed from him? Did they forget that Elisha, the healing, miracle-working prophet, died? And you know what it says in 2 Kings 13, 14? It says Elisha was fallen sick of the sickness whereof he died. That's Elisha, a prophet. 
Did they forget the words of Mary and Martha who said, Lord, behold, thou whom thy, 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 they, they love, thou lovest, he is sick. And the Bible says in 11 verses later, Lazarus is dead. Jesus loved Lazarus. Lazarus is dead in the same chapter. Please hear this. The island and the harbor were both in the purposes of God. And if you're here this morning and you're on the island and things are great and your health is good and the honey abounds, then you give glory to God for His goodness, for His power, and for His grace. There is no cause for pride in the purposes of God in a believer's life. If you know someone who's on the island of that blessing and you're not there, you rejoice with them that rejoice. Because there is no cause for envy in the purposes of God. And by the same token, if you know of someone or if you yourself are afflicted at Miletum and that sickness has led to some great overriding disappointment, then recognize this indisputable truth. God is God on the mainland just like He is on that island. Our Lord Jesus loved Lazarus when he was well, and Jesus loved Lazarus when he was sick and died of that same sickness. You know, Acts 9.37 says that Tabitha was full of good works and alms deeds. Now think about this. In this verse, it says she was full of good works and alms deeds. That means giving of herself. She was a giver. But the very next verse says it came to pass that she was sick and died. How does that make sense in the health and wealth crowd? You say, but pastor, this is Trophimus' last trip. Probably. But we know it's Paul's last trip. And you know, beloved, while we may not always understand the purposes of God, we should always trust the wisdom of God. God will never lead you where his grace will not sustain you. Which brings us to the second lesson, a lesson of purpose. Number two, I want you to notice there's a lesson about planning. In other words, you realize that neither of the two places I mentioned a moment ago, that little island or this place where he had to leave Trophimus, do you realize that neither of those were originally on Paul's map? In the latter, he's in chains, as you know. The island was a result of shipwreck, and they floated on pieces of a board. Miletum is a result of a long jail term and extradition for death. It is a reminder that the faithful servant of God can always, always expect the unexpected. Both unexpected blessings and unexpected burdens. Oh, that just doesn't work for me because I... You don't understand, I'm a planner and an organizer, and I'm a detail person, and I like to know where I'm going and exactly what I'll see when I get there. Well, all right. Make your plans. I make plans. I've got plans already for this coming year. But you know the Bible doesn't say the just shall live by their perfect plans. It does say the just shall live by faith. But preacher, I don't like to be surprised. Well, surprise. Surprise. <laughs> you'll never believe where you're going to be in five years. You know how true that is? You, you cannot believe right now where you're going to be and what's going to happen in your life, good and not so good, in five years. I was visiting one of our, one of our men in the hospital. His nephew was there, and he told me about a surprise his little boy gave him at church one day. They were sitting in church, and his little boy leaned over to him, and he said, Daddy, Fire trucks be here soon. I like fire trucks. This little boy was a prophet because in 30 seconds, fire trucks showed up at church, sirens blaring. You know why? Smart boy. You like fire tr trucks? Pull the fire alarm. Amen? <laughs> I wish I'd have thought of that when I was little because I had to set actual fires in order to have fire trucks come to my neighborhood. <laughs> you don't like surprises? I can tell you right now, fire trucks will be here soon. You know, folks, humanly speaking, we look at what happened here in this harbor and we say it doesn't make sense. I mean, after all, 
You think of the times that Paul has needed Trophimus. You think about of all the times that he needed a companion to travel and accompany him. This is it. At my first answer, Paul says in verse 16, no man stood with me. Trophimus could have been there. And here's the man to do it. Think about it for a moment. Here's the man. He's got the passport. He has his ticket. He has all the Roman credentials. He's a missionary who's anxious to go. He knows the language. He knows Timothy. He knows Luke. It was all planned and perfect. And our favorite expression is, you can tell it was meant to be. Or today's lingo, it was a God thing. Except, of course, it wasn't meant to be. And it was still a God thing. I never see anybody or hear anybody see that this didn't work out, this didn't work out, this didn't work out, this didn't work out, and there was a huge disappointment. People say, amen, that was a God thing. It's always when they got an extra paycheck out of nowhere. It's interesting to me that in verse 10 it doesn't say that Demas was sick. Why can't Demas be sick? If anything, it says that Demas left Paul because this present world had a lot to offer, so he was doing quite well. He was prospering. It doesn't say that Alexander the coppersmith did me uh, much evil and he, now he's sick. It doesn't say he's sick at all. It says that Trophimus. Beloved, think about it. Paul did not want to write these words down. He didn't want to write, Trophimus, have I left behind at Miletus sick? He didn't want to say these words because it was never in his plan. But we know that it was always in the mind of God and thus the word of God, which is eternal. In other words, there's nothing wrong with unplanned or unexpected blessings. Nor is there anything wrong when there's unplanned or unexpected burdens. Just remember what is expected of us is faithfulness, and what is unexpected to us was already foreseen by a loving Father. Always. And yes, the just shall live by faith. You see, but Pastor, that means there's going to be disappointments in life, you think? Yes. But you know what I've learned? That when the disappointments come from heaven's viewpoint... From eternity, they're never as disappointing as we think they'll be. They're never as disappointing as you think they are. Not from God's viewpoint. A few months ago, when I, when I first got the Toyota RAV, I'm driving, and I was going down US-1 from Earl Stewart. And I'm sort of driving and checking everything out, and I was told earlier that there are three power settings for performance. Normal, economy, saves gas, and sport mode. <clears throat> muscle. Well, there's a button down there. It's kind of hidden, and it's for, it says sport. It's for sport mode. So when I'm driving. I got kind of excited because I know it's only four cylinders. It's still, what, 200 horsepower, but, I mean, what could it do? But I did push it with anticipation, and I'm not kidding. As soon as I pushed it, there was this loud, awesome roar like the glass packs on a Mustang GT. <clears throat> I was like, Whoa. Now, my head didn't go back. I felt zero Gs. But I thought, this is crazy. And at that very second, this loud Dodge Challenger passed me on my left. <laughs> and there goes the roar. You know what I was? I was, I was disappointed. But you know what that disappointment was for me? A good thing. Because you know what I would be with a 580 horsepower twin turbo Porsche 911? I'd be in jail. <laughs> or the ER. Every believer's life, we preached a message years ago on detours and disappointments following Paul through his missionary journeys. Every believer's life is filled with detours and disappointments. Which brings us to the third lesson of the text. Number one, a lesson of purpose. Number two, a lesson of planning. Number three, notice a lesson of promise. See, Pastor, why promise? I'll tell you why. Because you'll notice verse 20, 
is written after verse 18. Verse 18 is a statement of faith and it's true. And then comes verse 20. In other words, here, let me ask you a question. Is Trophimus, the servant of God, still sick today? Say, Pastor, why didn't God heal Trophimus? Beloved, he did. And by the way, he may have healed Trophimus the day after Paul left. And so he went back to Ephesus, that short journey. He went to his hometown where Timothy was the pastor. And in about 20, 30 years, John himself would become his next pastor. And they may have served for many years together. That may have happened. Or... He may never have left Miletum. And there in that harbor died of that sickness. But either way, he's not sick today. In fact, not only is he not sick, he's in perfect health. And he's with Paul, also not sick. I think it's fascinating what Paul says about his impending execution in this text. Because, you know, he's already testified that his departure is at hand. He's ready to be offered. What a word that is. He has finished, he says in verse 7. But then he says this again, verse 18. And the Lord shall deliver me from every evil work. Wait a minute. Deliver you from every evil work? What about the evil that's about to behead you? Paul, you just gave this great statement of faith. That he will deliver you, that he delivered you out of the mouth of the lion. That's a few verses before. Is he going to deliver you from every evil work? Verse 18, and the Lord shall deliver me from every evil work and will preserve me unto his heavenly kingdom, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. You see, beloved, it's not just a platitude. It is for some people. It's not to me. Sometimes the healing is here, but always for a Christian, the healing is there. The Apostle John said of heaven, and there shall be no more sickness. The island and the harbor, they're both temporary. So that you know something, sometimes you're in a great place of blessing. It's an island of honey. But God calls you to move on. Sometimes you're in a place of sickness and disappointment, and for Paul and for Luke, they were called to move on. The point is this. They're all temporal. Things that are temporal are temporal, and that includes the rain and the sunshine of this world. What is eternal is the presence of God and the promises of God and the provisions of God in glory, which very quickly brings me to a last and a fourth truth. At least for me, it's a lesson of perseverance. Say, why, Pastor? Because think about it. You know, for two years, while Paul sat in a Caesarean prison, Trophimus could have become bitter or guilt-ridden or ashamed because he knows he's the reason he was the pretext for him being in jail in the first place. We saw this man... The mob was there because we saw Paul bring a Greek into the temple. It's not true, but they saw him in the streets of the city with him. And so, yeah, Trophimus could have said, you know, for two years, you know, I'm the reason, and I'm sure there were some believers who even said it, some of those really orthodox Jewish believers, you know, you know Trophimus, you should have had more wisdom. Now Paul's in jail. He could have been bitter, ashamed, that he was the purpose and the reason. And in fact, Trophimus has a lot of reasons to quit during that two long years, including now this apparent dire sickness. But he, here he is at the very last. He's still with Paul. And more importantly, he's still serving God. You know, if you look on a Bible map, you'll notice that Trophimus the Ephesian was not quite home when Paul left him for sick. You'll notice that Miletum is about a half a day's journey to Ephesus. It's about that far in the map. He was almost home and in a very real sense. 
God wants every believer to know that you're almost home. No matter how old you are or where you are in your Christian journey, or whether you're on this island of blessing and honey or in this harbor of sickness, either way, we're all almost home. Someday, beyond the reach of mortal kin, someday, God only knows just where and when. The wheels of mortal life shall all stand still, and I shall go to dwell on Zion's hill. Until that day, the just shall live by faith. Perseverance, faithfulness is what all of us are called to. Because the just shall live by faith. Our heads are bowed, please, and our eyes are closed for just a moment. We said earlier, I don't know, I don't know how you got here, why you're here. Some of you in this room undoubtedly are new, maybe lost. Many in this room are hurting and doubtful, and I can tell you that these pews could be filled five times over with people who just got discouraged and bitter for no good reason. They went through a trial and they had the wrong idea, really the wrong doctrine about who God is and how he works. Pastor Blaylock, I'm here today and, and I'm a Christian. I'm a child of the living God by his grace. But I needed the message today. I needed the truths that are contained in this little simple farewell address by the Apostle Paul in the Word of God. I'm saved, but I needed the message today as a believer with heads bowed. Who would say that? Would you lift your hands through the building as a testimony? God bless you. Amen. Amen. So many. Maybe you're here today and you don't know for sure that you're a saved, that you're, saved, that you're a child of God. I won't come and embarrass you, but we would love to pray for you. And without anyone looking, people can pray without knowing who it is as well. Pastor, I'm here today, and I'm not sure that I'm saved. Would you pray for me that I could be one of those counted among the faithful, one of those who knows that he's ready to go? And, and this man, Trophimus, sick and dying, was ready to go. Paul said, I'm ready. I'm ready. I know where I'm going. The time of my departure is at hand. Can you say that? Can you say that you know there's a crown waiting for you? Because Paul could, and not because of his good works because he put his faith in Jesus Christ. Pastor, that's me. I need to be saved. I don't know for sure that I am. Would you pray for me? Heads bowed, eyes closed. Who would say that? Would you lift your hand? This dear lady, anyone else? Just raise it up there really high till we see it. God bless you. We're going to pray in a moment, have a time of invitation. If God is speaking to your heart, won't you obey his voice? Father in heaven, thank you for the whole counsel of God. And thank you, Father, though we don't know much about this man, your servant, we do know that he traveled often far and wide with this apostle. And we know, Father, that for whatever reason in your great plan and in your wisdom, he was allowed to become sick and allowed to be disappointed because of that sickness. And so we pray, Father, that his example of faithfulness and your example of so great faithfulness will encourage us to live by faith, to trust you, to be grateful when we're on the island of miracles and blessings and grateful we're in the harbor of disappointments and detours. For these who've asked for prayer, draw them to you, please, in Jesus' precious name. Amen and amen. Let's stand together, shall we? Just as I am as the hymn on the very first verse, if God is speaking to your heart just as I am. As we sing, sing along with Brother Terry. Brother Sam will be at the front. If it's a public decision, you need to speak with someone as we sing. You come, Brother Terry. Just as I am without one thing, but that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou bidst me come to thee, O Lamb of God, I 
and amen. Be seated. We're going to baptize. It'll take just a moment. Brother Terry's going to come lead us in him. Three hundred eighty-seven, three eight seven. I will follow thee, my Savior. Amen. Many of you know the streets, of course, and uh, Bob and Amy, and of course Norma's here, but uh, his father and his mom, his father's in heaven now. Bob flew with Eastern Airlines many, many years ago, and for many, many years with Eddie Regenbacher, and then he flew for Eastern, and then um, over in the Far East, and he met Amy working with Japan Airlines. And I can remember many times visiting with Bob and Norma and talking with them, and Bob would say, pray for my son. Pray for my son and for protection and so forth. And, and this dear brother who's accepted Christ as his Savior uh, some time ago wants you to know it. He wants to follow the Lord and believer's baptism. And they've been coming to every service faithfully and growing, and, and we love them. And so in obedience to the command of our Lord and Savior, upon your public profession of faith in him, I baptize you, my brother. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Buried in the likeness of his death, raised in the likeness of his resurrection, and God's people said... Amen. Let's stand together, shall we? Terry's going to close in prayer. Be sure to be here tonight, Brother Chris Estep. will bless your heart and uh, be in your places. I know it'll be raining because it said 100% chance of rain. So just go right through the rain and be here, all right? God bless you, Brother Terry. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you once again for allowing us to be able to join with this fellowship to worship and to hear the Word of God preached powerfully today. We thank you for this one who has come to demonstrate his willing obedience to follow you. I pray that we also would follow you and obey you as we should. Help us to return again in the next appointed time to worship with others and to hear your word, we pray in Christ's name. Amen.